Sorry, I'm gonna put these headphones on, Jerry. You're probably fucking talking to me, but I don't know. If you don't know so I'll find it. Sorry. Just a sec. She got Yeah, yeah, I'll put, I'll go back to where I was at and just pump them up here. I'm not an academic or a doctor, but I've been obsessed with sound since I was five and I've been working in professional recording studios since 1988. Before researching for this project, I knew nothing about the neuroscience behind the way my own brain had developed, but I did know that due to having spent much of my childhood from the age of 5 to 11 in hospital, and most of that in a room alone with just a radio, I'd accidentally developed good analytical listening. So my brain must have overdeveloped my listening skills and underdeveloped my visual recognition of both language and faces. I spent from 1976 to about 1982 listening to the radio and I became fixated on recording studio techniques and studio gear. I finally got back on my feet when I was uh, 12 and my sound obsessed brain managed to fly through all my music theory grades. From school, I landed a place on the recording technology course at Salford Poly, which was mentored by George Martin and taught by legendary producer engineer Bill Leader. I got student of the year and immediately got a job at Strawberry Studios in Stockport. At that point, I was 17 and straight into sessions with New Order, Happy Mondays, Lisa Stansfield, the BBC Orchestra, Charlottes, Wilder Twist. I, ju- I, ju- I don't know, like, I might just put it up through the whole thing and then have a listen back and see. Do you know? spent the last 30 years in recording studios working to tape and building an understanding of the psychology of the recording process. This project made me investigate the neuroscience to get a better insight into both the creative process and the listening experience. Back in the late 90s, professional recording studios had to either invest thousands in the latest Pro Tools or shut down. A real two-inch multi-track tape cost £200. It could hold either 15 or 30 minutes of recordings, depending on which tape speed you chose to run at. 30 inches per second equals 15 minutes of recording. 15 inches per second equals 30 minutes of recording. Tape machines were costly to maintain, and multi-track editing of the individual tracks was impossible. There was no level of undo, and so it was really no surprise that Pro Tools was embraced by nearly everybody. There was so little demand for the reels of tapes that the manufacturers shut down and getting fresh tape became a really, a really big problem. The problem was not actually solved until a few years ago. Analog tape is expensive, tape machines are expensive and yet after 30 years of digital recording reels of tape were being manufactured again by by two two, uh, companies and there is a big movement back towards analog.
Here's some of the reasons why it makes sense to think about analog. When it comes to our senses, smell and taste are linked, hearing and touch are linked, and vision stands alone, and its activities dominate the other senses. It's the queen bee. Closing your eyes really helps focus, so Stevie Wonder's on a massive hearing advantage there. Playing your instrument uses procedural memories. These are memories that have formed hard wiring and therefore you don't really have to think about them. Ducky water freezing in the season of the drought. Out the water, back the bell again, the ordinary day, Vandy the moon, pull a body in. Never asked for, nor neither refused. Happiness like nausea comes and goes. Though the text is written, there is error in the prose. I'll hate you forever for what you've done. I'll hate you forever, I'll hate you forever for what you do. When someone is really good at something and you, you put them in a brain scanner, in an MRI, whilst they're doing that thing that they're really good at, it surprisingly shows that the brain's doing very little, it's using very little energy, so it's not lighting up. Once you have that skill hardwired, you're free to use the rest of your brain to think about something else, to think artistically. And I guess that's why our music teachers say when you get to the end of your piece, now once more with feeling, those senses, that hearing and touch, are, are very much linked. So it's not breaking news that you need to hammer the basics into your automatic motor skills to be able to add a bit of creative flair to your skill. Nor is it shocking news that your optic nerve trumps all the rest of your senses and it uses most of your brain processing power. Change across a distance cannot be measured by hand. Let us an answer to shun the water and the sand. Never ask for no need to refuse. Let Analog recording studios all used to be screenless, and mine still is. And the engineer knew the way around the studio, like a musician knows the way around their instrument. They knew all the buttons. And there was no need to read anything, there was no new updates, no new software to learn, nothing changed or moved without you going in and changing it. So once you had that desk and that tape machine hammered into your head and lodged into your motor skills, you could really fly it creatively and push it to its limits. So none of your brain goes into data processing and the optic nerve is idling and all those long-term memories are there for the taking. You kind of feel like you can do it in your sleep. So if you're not reading anything, you can be sat there thinking, oh, do you remember the time I mic'd that harmonium and then I put the mic into an amp, re mic the amp in a corridor and that sound, we should try that here. You know, those sort of thought there at the back of your head and you're able to pull them forward. And memories like that are easy to recall because they involve people and places, not just something you did clicking on a computer. So they're lumped in there with the people and places info, which is much easier for us to store in our brains. Those um, story memories, those anecdotal memories, um, can't be accessed when your optic nerve is working full tilt, processing information that's moving. As soon as you open your eyes, your brain starts tasking your ears for balance information to make sure you're not falling. Um, your hearing's kind of thrown into low res, but as soon as you close your eyes, your high resolution listening analysis returns. God's no snitch, God's no snitch, yeah. Now I'm fucking angry. There are so many updates and endless new possibilities in the world of digital recording that the environment never has time to, to become comfortably familiar so you can really explore it um, like you can with analog. And obviously we can't navigate screen-based tech with our eyes closed. On top of that, we don't really hear that well when we're looking at stuff. I mean, we just don't try calling somebody for the dinner when the TV's on. God's no snitch, God's no snitch, no, I'm so...
There's another big problem, and that's patterns. We are wired to search for patterns. Pattern recognition is part of the human makeup, and we like to recognize patterns, and we like to control them, and we get freaked out by random stuff. So when a screen is telling us that it looks out of time, or a screen is telling us that it looks out of pitch, there is a big danger. We are going to believe what we see and not what we hear. And then when it comes to the listener's perspective, they too are looking for patterns. And if after a minute into it, they think they've got the measure of it and they can predict what's going to happen and they've had no surprises, then they lose interest. One of the records that, that drew me to engineering and to studios was, was like Andy Warhol by David Bowie, you know, that just that, that space and time, that random Andy Warhol, take one, take two, and the laugh, um, those are the moments, those are the golden moments that you really, really remember. He let you forever. He let you forever. He let you forever. I have a lot of people ask me about the Illum Pipes at the start of the Lancome album on the track, What Will We Do When We Have No Money? I think what they connect to is the wheeze of the bellows. It, it really connects them, the listener to the musician and so that they feel like they were there in that moment in time. Random stuff is what keeps the listener interested. The capturing of a moment in time, the sonics that are rich in complex harmonies that are blended together because they simultaneously happened in the same space. And you can hear the obvious human input, you can hear the emotional labor. In other words, authentic, real magic, captured to tape, preferably for eternity. Like a director chooses camera angles, I carefully place the microphones to try and capture the force of the moment and hit that balance between expectation and surprise. Understanding when to tidy up and when not to tidy up because sometimes cleaning removes the context which can disengage the listener. The moment itself has to be nurtured, so careful ongoing observation of the artist to see how far I can push them till they reach their A game. Everybody's different, but the limitations of analogue play a huge part in pushing creativity. I recently read a study on creativity um, where it was grouped into three categories, combination, exploration and transformation. The study by Dr. Catherine Trump and concluded that constraints helped creativity, helped creative thought thrive. Combinational creativity needs the brain to be in a state that it can access the long-term memories and combine them in a new way, so it needs to be relaxed enough to kind of think of, of stuff that's stored. And then explorational creativity needs your, your working brain to be um, available, your, your frontal cortex, so that you can look at the rules and and push them and push the boundaries. And then transformational creativity needs you to be able to pull random thoughts and change direction. But all of these rely on the challenge of constraints. When there's no constraint, you're easily thrown into choice paralysis and decision fatigue. Procrastination often derails creativity. So limiting the options to procrastinate boosts your decision-making abilities. There's a great quote in the brilliant David Byrne book, This Is Music, that, that, says, that says opportunity and facility is invention. So you have to give artists 
the tools to do it and the environment to do it. And so trying to write songs and trying to be thoroughly creative when everybody's just looking at this Google type screen or the same screen, the same template, and they're just doing it in, a, in the same environment, the home studio, the non-inspirational, the same home place that they also do their cooking and their laundry. And that's, that's not the right way to approach making somebody creative. You need to take them out of their comfort zone. You need to put surround them with things that are new. And you also need to take those visual stimulation, the data processing stimulation away from them and give them a load of sonic toys. Give them the space to think and a load of stuff in front of them. And you're almost stood behind them going, it needs organ. And you're not saying it, you're just, you know, going, look at that. <laughs> it needs organ, yes, that's right, it needs organ. <laughs> and, and then also happy accidents. That's, we don't have happy accidents in digital because if you have an accident, you press the undo button. But what about happy accidents? What about all those accidents that you have and you then have to deal with it? Because that's the way analog works. You know, something happens, somebody drops a beat, some, some, something that you didn't expect happens and you have to come up with an innovative way to turn that negative into a positive. Yeah. Um, and often those are the moments that when people then consume the final thing, when people listen to the final record, they think, why did they think of that? That is madness. They thought of it because something happened. You have to come up with an idea when there's no level of undo. Take. Yeah. Or if I just instead of that goes, shite. <laughs> <laughs> I should have done that. Context and spatial perspective are vital in art, and they're vital in film, and they're vital in music. Sonic isolation is unnerving. If everything's recorded as like direct signal with no room reflection, it sounds uncomfortably close. And I know people like add reverbs and stuff, but you can still tell. We're, we're able to work out the, the space that something was recorded in. And that closeness, that, that, that weirdness to space um, can cause anxiety. And our brains work out the space that they think something was recorded in. And the bigger and the more roomier the sonic space, the more it kind of feels welcoming. If you think about like the chorus of Teen Spirit by Nirvana or Heroes by Bowie or any Slade record. Instruments and vocals that have been performed together in the same space, they have complex blended harmonics that bounce into each other and into the, into the, the surrounding walls and ceilings. And it's a far richer tone, it's a far richer sound than, than anything that's just been recorded uh, individually in a dead space. If you look at sort of Phil Spector records, Joe Meek or Motown records, and then compare them to so much of what we hear being released today, it's twenty past seven. Right. Do you need food? I'm okay. Well, I'd, I'd probably eat soon enough. You'd eat as well? Yeah. This would probably be a good chance to, since we're kind of between <laughs> things now. Yeah. yeah. Probably be best to eat now. <laughs> <laughs> Decisions, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some genres are reliant on, on individuals' performance and if the listener can't really hear the context or the human labour, it's harder for them to, to value that music and to value that artist and to want to invest their time and their money in that. I've often captured folk or singer-songwriter performances and then it's gone off to be mixed somewhere else and the mix engineer has applied kind of pop perfection techniques and removed what I would consider like the dynamic and the emotion and, and elements of the of the human labour. And I appreciate that different genres have different aspirations, but punk and folk and indie, world music, jazz, rock, reggae, these all need to be dynamic, emotional, human performances. 
Hospital sounds aren't that great, are they? They're very weird, yeah. Very Trying strange. to work out. Just well, you get so bored, you see, and that's what that's what's missing in life now. Nobody gets bored anymore. But there's so much entertainment on demand and so much um, you know, there's never a dull moment. You sit there for like two seconds and you think I'll check Twitter and I'll check Facebook and I'll look at this. You don't get the opportunity to sit there for hours just entertaining yourself. But when you do that, you are operating in a different part of your brain to the part of your brain that's sat checking Twitter. There's a highway between your eyes, your optic nerve, and the back of your head. And if you send information from, from your eyes, then that highway is blocked using up that highway to, to process what you're looking at. As soon as you shut down your eyes, you free all that traffic off that highway, you wait a while, and it, the traffic flows the other way. All your distant memories, not your immediate, like, did I put the oven on memories, your distant memories, your idle thoughts, start coming, and they start joining up into your current day thoughts. And that's when creativity starts happening, when all the weird things that you've ever thought start coming out and joining up with the current situation. It's different networks. It's the Salience Network, the Here and Now Network, and the, you know, Daydream Network, uh, Past and Future Network. And the only way that they get to connect and make innovation and creativity is if you allow them to. But the first thing you need to do is stop processing data. Um, I'm ready for my vocal talk. <laughs> okay, I'll do it right this time. <laughs> I speak a lot to my to my artists, my clients, um, about uh, frequencies, about healing frequencies and anxiety frequencies, because our heads are designed to amplify sort of three to four k, especially like around three and a half k, which is actually where the average baby scream comes in at. So, for me, mixes should be bass and mid-range heavy and you tread lightly with those baby scream frequencies those three four k sonics because they induce anxiety they kickstart the primal aspect of our brain the kind of panic button the amygdala part of the limbic system that is associated with um with quite negative emotions like um fear and stress and um, that can lead to depression i genuinely have concerns about current mix and and mastering styles and and if they're adding to, to mental health problems. Singing out these blues Lord knows I've been crying Singing out these blues Lord knows I've been crying Evolved to focus on the lower speech frequencies. Now, speech frequencies come in at around sort of 100 to 300 hertz. So we have evolved cognitive areas that we can uh, differentiate in those areas much better than other frequencies. We're listening with interest and we're not listening with panic into those frequencies. And that obviously, I mean, if you think about it, what would you rather have, like Barry White reading you a story or a baby screeching in your ear? Um, it's kind of obvious. In music, all the healing frequencies, the frequencies that are supposed to be um, very good for you, and different religions and different cultures believed to have healing properties, they're all in the low to mid range. And all the frequencies that cause anxiety and stress are all in the high end. But the streaming and modern listening methods are, of today are delivering far more high end than low end and they're often cutting a lot of the mid range in order to create not a dirge in their tiny weeny little speakers um, and this is genuinely going to take its toll on especially young developing brains You do 
have to sort of look at what you've got. And even if it's an important part of the song, it might be putting out a really horrible frequency. So you have to either then walk the room looking for where it happens to catch it in a nice light. Um, and it might have a nice harmonic somewhere else in the room and mic that. Um, or go to the desk and take out its fundamental, as we call it, its main frequency, so that you're only listening to the idea of it and not it, because it will knacker your ears or will annoy you. Um, and that's something that, you know, these, that's the art of engineering and the art of producing, going through finding sounds and going, yeah, well, they need that sound in there, but God, it's not nice. Um, so we need to find a way to make it nice.